In my presentation today, I made four key points. First, inequality is excessive. I focus on the United States, but this is true to an important degree of the UK as well. Uh, we can see whether it's in comparison to other nations or in comparison to our own history, inequality is at an exceptionally high level at the present time. Second, excessive inequality is harmful. It's a drag on our economic productivity and it is socially divisive, tearing at the fabric of our society. Third, inequality is responsive to social policy. We have concrete examples of policies that lessen the degree of inequality in society. Now, if you accept the first three points, then you arrive at my fourth point, which is that we need new research to help identify programs, policies, and practices that reduce inequality. Our research has shown that in Scotland, social inequalities in higher education entry are largely explained by subject choice in schools, in secondary schools. People from lower social background tend to choose they are less likely to choose uh, um, subjects like academic subjects like English languages and um, all sciences, which lead to um, facilitating entry into higher education, especially the most prestigious uh, universities. Um, now, um, there is of course a policy implication of this, uh, that schools have to make uh, um, an effort to um, inform decisions at school level, at secondary level, so that these students don't lose out from not taking those subjects which are so important for their future. Well, my work with the Scottish Government is around providing the best evidence to develop policy and to implement policy. And my area of interest is education. Obviously, we're interested in ensuring that every child in Scotland fulfills their potential. So the research that we're hearing about today will help us greatly in thinking about how we deal with the needs of children from different backgrounds, how we ensure that they get the chance to, to maximise their potential to enable them to attend higher education if that's what they wish to do. Well, I think practitioners need to be aware of research findings such as those presented at the conference today uh, when they're working with young people. Um, if subject choice is, is limiting the options for young people in future educational progress, that definitely needs to be taken into account by timetablers, by guidance staff, by careers advisors and so on. However, subject choice on its own is only one of a series of complicated elements involved in the individual choices young people make. Their perceptions, their desires, their motivations, a whole range of factors have to come into effect. So the ideal situation is where the practitioners are fully informed about background factors, including most importantly socioeconomic differences and the effect these have on prior attainment, because prior attainment is a strong influence on subject choice. I think really one very important function comparative research serves is to provide a platform for discussion. When you get people from different countries together looking at results from comparative research, um, of course everyone's always interested at first to see where their own country is and is it in a good position or a bad position uh, relative to others. But besides that really obvious uh, aspect, it gets people talking about the reasons behind any picture you might see. So it can be a very effective means of highlighting differences between countries, but also through highlighting these uh, starting discussions on, between researchers or on the policy level about the reasons for these differences. The other thing uh, comparative research helps you to do is um, use differences that exist that exists between countries and how things are done to actually isolate the effects of these different ways of doing things. If two countries are pretty similar but are different in one specific regard, then it's much easier to see what that difference is actually doing with regard to social inequalities.